welcome everybody to this webinar, this um, ANSNIC Dradius webinar. My name is Susanna Sabine and I will be your host for today. Um, I will be joined um, in a little bit when they turn their cameras and things on by um, Sandrine and um, Andrew from the University of Queensland. They will be, oh, there they are. Hi guys, welcome. Talking, to, sorry, they will be talking to us today about research data storage and sharing made easy with the University of Queensland's research data manager. Who's talking today? Sandrine, um, who's the project lead on this research data management um, amazing initiative, and um, Dr. Andrew Janke, who's the technical lead for the project. So I'll hand it over to you, Sandrine. Thank you. So, yeah, we're going to both do this today. So. The first thing is to just give you an introduction to UQ for those who aren't aware. So UQ is a, a university of about 2,700 academics. We have about 5,000 HDRs typically at any point in time, so PhD and master's students. And this project was also not about just building a new system, but it was about changing how UQ thinks about research data. It's about how we manage research data long term. It's how we meet our obligations to publishers and to funders. It's all the questions around how do we store research data for 40 years? How do we store it for 25? How do we store it for 100 years? It, it's the questions that are often hard to think about. And while we're not going to say we solved everything with this project, but it's at least we could build a system that had a look towards some of those problems. So when we started the project, it was a initiative out of the Office of the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research. And it started off as a project around human data and that human data was hard to store. Um, researchers are under a lot of obligations around human data and how we manage it long term. But with the system we developed, it was noticed that perhaps we could try roll it out for the whole of UQ for all types of research data. So when we went and talked to academics before we started and piloted the system, what you see there is a lot of the problems that academics were having. And, and this is pretty consistent across the whole of the university. Um, multiple people were entering multiple things into multiple systems and that was seen as a, a waste of time. It was a, a loss of research time. Um, there was no reward in a lot of these systems around why researchers were entering all the metadata and information in systems. And collaboration is always hard, especially to do it within the restrictions that are placed upon you by some contracts within the university and funding arrangements. We had students running away with data on laptops and you couldn't contact them at the end of PhDs, all the things that happen in most universities. So it was about building a system to help researchers with their problems, but in the process of doing so, also build a system that happened to meet the university's obligations around research data and having good collections of data attached with publications. So, you know, here we are, we're essentially playing Santa Claus here because We've been asked for the moon. Um, we, we might not be able to make it. We might, but you know, we've, we've got to try. So the way we approached it was instead of asking for funding to solve all the problems in the world, including the moon, we, we decided that instead we should stage this as a series of projects. And these have run over the past uh, now two and a half years within UQ. And it was staging it as manageable chunks. So the first part was around building a metadata system, which was like a DMP, but a whole lot more minimal. Um, it was trying to decide which pieces of information were absolutely business critical and nothing more that we needed to know about researchers' projects. Um, part of that messaging was around looking at existing university systems and recognizing that these systems were necessarily researcher focused. So the existing library catalog systems and the, the publication systems were centered around the researcher as an individual rather than around projects. So it meant we had to build a new system alongside the existing library systems around projects. The second one was about how do we store research data and make it available in all the places that researchers expect. So this meant that we talk to researchers and get them understand, tell us how do you work with your data currently. The third project is where we start to get a bit interesting and this is around how do we attach the working data storage to outputs. So how do we 
identify a group of data within a working project and this led to a publication. And number five, sorry, number four, we're not there yet. Number five is about closing the loop. It's about how do we roll this out to the whole of a university? It's not a, not a system which we thought where we could just launch it with an email and a bit of fanfare and say, here's a new system, you should use it. Um, we didn't think that would work well. So we had a whole strategy around that, which we'll go into here today. So in a bit more detail, so there were some specific things we were going in on the first project, and that is we sort of had a, an idea that it had to be a no black holes approach. And by black holes approach, this is expanding upon the idea of a researcher might enter ethics information into multiple systems within the university. They would enter their ethics number alongside their grants. They would enter an ethics number to the HERA committee. They would make sure they have ethics locally within their centres. So it meant multiple systems that they were entering information in. So even for simple things, these are what turn off our users if they have to enter the same information again. So we, we had to remove that type of system. We also had to know that what was essential. So for us, what was essential was the type of project so what sort of data they had, the collaborators they wanted to include on that project, including national and international, and the unit that led the project. And this is not, even when you say the unit that leads it, that's not a simple thing because people get in the quandary of, I'm administered by this unit in my university, but I have a joint position with this other unit. So the messaging we always give is, it's not about you, it's about the project. And then the story becomes a lot simpler. Typically, everybody can identify a research unit that leads a project rather than they, they themselves. And then we ask them where, we, sorry, we don't ask um, how they would like to store their data, how long they need to back it up for the types of security. Instead, we make those decisions because it's a constantly changing landscape of the Australian Privacy Act, the ARC rules, so we ask about the type of data, and from that we make the decision. The second project, in a bit more depth, is a, the feedback we got is that a lot of people were using Dropbox, a lot of people were using Google Drive, a, a lot of people were using Arnett Cloud Store, some people used university file sharing systems, which at the time in UQ were faculty-based, so every faculty had their own share and they couldn't share between faculties, and it meant that the system we developed had to be as good as all those systems because if it wasn't, there wasn't going to be good uptake. So the system we built is a single view of storage, we tend to call it. Um, we set up a single drive letter across the whole of the university. For UQ, this is new. For a lot of universities, this isn't new, so we understand where this might seem like it's pretty simple. But for a researcher in UQ, the fact that someone can see the same drive letter they can in another school was new. Um, we also had to have a cloud-based system, it was important, and we synchronised the view between those two systems. So something you put into the R drive, as we call it, will appear in the cloud system, and something that another researcher puts in the cloud system for a project will appear in the R drive as well. For some researchers, we also mount the same storage into HPC facilities, because that's where they need the data, they don't want to be copying it. We also have a synchronization client, much the same as Arnet or Dropbox or Cloud Store, any of these systems, which means that a researcher can choose to synchronize what they want from their projects to their own devices, their laptops, their iPads, their tablets, their whatever. And this is an interesting use case in that researchers do things like they go out and they record interviews with people out in the field on their iPhone. So it means we can support that now. They no longer have to then plug their iPhone into their laptop. Everything should just work for them. That's what we're aiming for. The second part is that it has to work on any, any platform within UQ. Um, this is important in that existing systems, there were second class citizens, the Mac users, the Linux users in the university. We always took a view from the start of this project that this system has to work equally well across all major platforms that our users were using. It had to be easy within Australia, which meant there's one option, the Australian Access Federation. And for international, there's really only the EduGame Federation. The other way to approach this is you have to make individual usernames for your international collaborators. And that's not great because the experience for the international users and the national users 
should be as seamless as those within UQ. I think when you're building these systems, you have to think about building it not just for your own users, but we always thought about building this system from the start for the external user as well, which meant they had to use their existing university credential or we've already lost the game. This means we need to rely upon something called the Edgeperson Principal Name, the EPPN. This wasn't supported in the AAF Federation when we first started. Um, it now is. It's an hour required um, attribute, which meant we had to do a lot of legwork talking to the universities who don't support that attribute yet and raise it on their radar as to why we thought it was important. It's about getting a long-term persistent ID on external researchers. And we can't rely upon email for that because an email address is often recycled within a university. There's only so many Hien Noyans you can have at a university before that email address is reused, which would allow access to a data set to a new Hien Noyan who shouldn't have access to that data set. So we had to use persistent identifiers. We now capture ORCID wherever we can, for example. And that may be a long-term view, but at the moment, the adoption of ORCID within Australia is not huge, so we can't rely upon it yet. Industry partners are hard. We had a couple of thoughts at the start of the project of how we'd handle them. We, of course, support out-of-the-box sharing via email. So you can share a one-time link to a subfolder or to an entire folder to an industry partner. They get a one-time link to their email address and they get a password which is auto-generated. So it's much the same as Dropbox, the same workflow. We also knew that we wanted to get a persistent ID on industry partners where possible to solve the 40-year problem. Um, our thoughts around this are for LinkedIn. We get what I would call very bimodal feedback on this. Some people like it, some people hate it. Um, the message we have to go out with is that we've made LinkedIn available for you. If you choose to use it, it's available. Um, we certainly haven't gone out with the message of saying you integrate your industry partner with LinkedIn. Um, the feedback we get from some of our industry partners within UQ is that some, again, some like it, some don't. Um, so it always has to be about providing options. The third deliverable was about DMPs. Our researchers needed them, um, often for grants, for various things. And for a lot of people, these things are uh, confusing. So that meant for funders, they're often asking for this. Ethics often asks for this. And often what happens is a researcher will enter a bit of throwaway text which they've canvassed around with their friends and see what else someone else has put in an application. And it doesn't really mean much. They're not invested in the process, which we'd like them to be, around data management planning, even if it's very soft touch. So from the start, we ask some questions. These are optional. And if the researcher fills out these tick boxes, it means that from that information, what we can do is start to build a picture of how they're managing their metadata within the project. They can fill out again as much of this information as they need or they want or they see fit. We encourage them to fill out as much as possible, but none of it is mandatory. And we also don't, don't present these questions at the start. We only present them if they go back into the RDM system so it's not overload. When they first fill out a record, they only see a very small amount of information requested. When they go back to update their record, they're encouraged to add this extra information. So these are the sorts of questions we ask information about. Um, these have been structured largely upon existing DMP sections, but we try and make things as drop down and as easily fillable as possible. This means that when they go back to their records, we provide easily downloadable data management plans because we now have all the information that we know about the project and we build a as detailed data management plan as the information they provide. So if the feedback is from their funder that they need information about intellectual property, well then we ask them to fill out that section, tick and cross the boxes, regenerate the PDF and a data management plan is generated for them, which is compliant with the various funding requirements and the, the paper requirements as much as we can possibly make it. So then they just copy and paste that into their grant application. It was also about we need to provide an easy way for them to do things which are currently hard for them. And things which are hard for researchers are things like backup if they have to manage it themselves. Um, we're also starting to think about long-term curation of data at UQ. It's not easy because most researchers acknowledge the question I lead on with is, you know, how long do you have to keep your data for? I often get blank looks for that. And I'll 
see the, the presentation by asking a question of, you know, who is ARC funded and then who knows how long you have to keep the data. And the answer is five. Often we get seven because that's just the science answer. And it's about doing the education, but also making them aware that we're not requiring them to know this information. It's about if we give them all the information, if they give us the minimal amount of information about their project, about the grant, about the type of grant it is, if it's from the application ID, it means that the RDM system can make the decision about how long to keep that data for them. And it also means we can provide them a system where we can guarantee that working data will exist 25 years from now because the data is stored by project, there's an identified group of CIs by their persistent ID wherever possible, and if they've left, it means that we have the school, the unit that led that project, and that means there's a role, there's someone who's identified as looking after that project long term. So maybe we've solved all the world's pro you know, problems, maybe we haven't. Um, we can tell you now about what the experience has been so far based upon the system we've developed and the rollout process we have so far. So Andrew <clears throat> has explained that it's a series of projects that, we're that the UQRDM was built upon. So um, I'm going to concentrate my part on uh, IDMP4, which, was, uh, which is closing the loop, which is the implementation of the system at the University of Queensland. So uh, we are tasked with the uh, with implementing the system across all university. So that means talking to researchers in life science, but also talking to researchers in humanities, their needs, their perception, their vocabulary uh, are different. So we need to adapt ourselves. So we started the launch in January. Uh, we are now halfway through. Um, and so far, we, we're looking good. It has been a swift uptake. So uh, we know that uh, more than a thousand projects have been created on the, on the system. We also know that they have been set up as collaborative projects with two or more collaborators for each project. This is really good news for us because it demonstrates that people are not simply dumping the data of me in the system. They're actually using the, the system, the platform, to really drive their collaborations. So who are, um, who are our users? Well, um, we now have more than 1,200 Unix idea. Um, so we know that the majority are staff members. Uh, we also have a lot of students, in particular uh, higher uh, HDR students, so higher degree by research. And also so about 300 external collaborators. So we know that these are mostly from external universities. Um, so Andrew has briefly mentioned that, but it was not just about saying, okay, you've got a platform, go and use it now. We spent a lot of time doing some pre-work uh, before the launch. So uh, it was about making sure that the senior management is informed and also it is taking a big part in the project in engagements. So the DVCR, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Research, is sponsoring the project. And um, there has been some really clear messages in terms of communication to our Associate Dean Research to make sure that they were aware of the system and were supporting it. We have done some work as well with ITS. So uh, it's about working with different sections of ITS, not only about the communication that we uh, would like them to uh, rely on our behalf, but also with the help desk. So it's about us understanding what the support desk needed in, and making sure that we were putting in place resor resources that they will require when they need to be at the front end and making sure that they answer users' inquiries. The other uh, category of people we've done some work with before the launch were, were the librarians. So at UQ, we've got liaison librarians. So each school at the university has dedicated librarians who look after researchers, help them answer the questions about research. So we need to know who they are, training them, involving them in the implementation that was coming in the school. Um, so it's really a partnership with all these stakeholders. Um, in terms of the rollout strategy, um, we approach it a little bit like a roadshow. So we're spending time with each unit, whether there's school, a faculty, uh, a faculty centre, an institute at UQ, and we uh, plan with them a dedicated and pur purposeful rollout. So what does it involve? 
Well, it involves uh, quite a long engagement period. So uh, we spend time uh, communicating with the executive of the unit, so the head of school, for example, the school manager, to explain why we're coming, uh, what the platform is about, how we would like to tackle the presentation to the whole units. We do that, the presentation to the whole units and students, we do that typically at what we call week zero. And following that, there's a two weeks of um, a dedicated support period that is offered to the school, where we come back, educate some more, spend some time with students, whatever they need us to do, in order to drive uptakes. Uh, along the way, we communicate with the head of school, for example, so they then know uh, what the uptake looks like, open a survey, collect feedback, and reflect on, on the presentation and reflect on the rollout. Um, so that's pretty much our engagement with units, but that also involves a lot of people outside of the schools. So, so for example, uh, research administrators. So they are based in faculty or in school. Um, they're the ones with the most local knowledge, and they're usually the first point of call uh, for researchers. Um, we also talk to the research partnership managers, so they're the people in charge of contracts with industry partners at UQ, because research partnership managers are also the first point of contact for collaborative agreements to share the data or check that the contract already in place with industry partner partners allow the researcher to use the UQ research data manager. We talk to the research integrity advisors, so they are academics who can answer questions about integrity and best practice at UQ, and it's important that we make them aware that we're talking to their unit, uh, because there also will be a point of contact when people are asking questions about the UQ RDM when they are asking how it fits with the integrity and the code of conduct. Uh, and last point, we're talking with the re ITS research, sorry, ITS uh, relationship managers. So um, they are uh, people based in ITS and they are the link between schools and ITS. So they're the one answering the questions about storage when people approach them, for example. So it's about, this exercise is really about raising the awareness of the platform amongst this group. And the, our message is always the same with all these people. It's not just an IT part. It's not just an IT platform. It's about making sure that it doesn't become a big dump of unorganized data. So it's one of the messages that we keep on stressing. That it is for projects and not for people. Uh, so not about the last 10 years of data of me, of me, but really the data of the project that I'm associated with at this point in time. So it needs to be project specific because it's described by the metadata and organized by projects. Uh, and to uh, encourage this approach, we, we have uh, the collaborative tool that is available to them. So people understand better when you say, well, actually define your project by the group of collaborators that you need to give access to, to the research data. Um, as part of the role as well, um, we, we try to establish a data custodian role. So um, going back to our form, our metadata form, Andrew mentioned before that we ask uh, which school or, uh, or department leads the project. So that gives us pretty much a chain of command because in each school we're setting up the data custodian. So they are, uh, it's a role usually uh, held by the head of school that will help us to have that chain of command to, to, uh, to make sure that the data is never orphaned. So for example, when, when the library receives a request regarding a data set for reuse, and the investigators are no longer at UQ. So the data custodian will be contacted to seek their recommendation. For example, when people uh, leave projects and they are no longer uh, UQ staff on the record, so it's about transferring the lead um, of the project to somebody else. The data custodian role can either act or delegate in that case. It's also about research integrity. So when concerns are raised on the integrity of a research project and the UQ integrity office needs to investigate and potentially gain access to the research data, they can contact the data custodian role. So it's uh, really a little step towards uh, the F and the A of fair data. So findable and accessible, at least within UQ. That way, we know that UQ has a pretty good oversight of the research data if, it's, if it needs to be found again. As part of the implementation, so IDMP4, uh, we are also instilling the message that the UQ RDM is here to stay. 
So we're working with other departments at the university, such as graduate school, so uh, the unit that looks after our PhD student, for example. It's about making them aware of the platform, of course, encouraging the, uh, them to communicate to students that it's a good tool to use. It's about talking to the Office of Ethics, so if they've got questions or if they've got concern in an ethics application, they can point the researchers to the UQRDM platform. It's about the Office of Research Integrity, who needs to answer questions about research integrity. And again, if they are, if they come, if they are, um, if researchers ask them questions, they can point them to our platform. And last thing, it's about um, we also uh, using with the Research Computing Center, who looks after um, HPC uh, facilities at UQ, to make them. Um, to make sure that they know that uh, they can direct uh, researchers to us as well. The other aspect on which we are working at the moment is it's about linking. So uh, going back to IDMP3, which is which is about migrating data to manage collection. So uh, so far, the UQRDM has been used for working data, and it it, it, it is intended to. Uh, to be used that way. What we need to do is um, making sure that the green arrow that you've got on, on the slide here actually goes towards output. So it's about a researcher selecting a, a subset of the data in their project and pushing it towards the data set for which they can obtain DOI and uh, linking them to our institutional repository, which is called eSpace. So again, that's another little step towards fair data. Um, the other aspect of that project is also about archiving. Um, so it's uh, making sure that at the end of a project, researchers can select everything and push it to archive. This is about compliance, making sure that uh, UQ help researchers to comply with the legis legislative requirements. So um, if the data needs to be kept for five, 10, 10 25 years. And uh, so still in our way of linking with persistent identifier, we have um, made that link with Orkut. Um, so people can actually see with the collaborators that they've got involved in the project, uh, their Orkut idea. So permanent identifier to make sure that the data doesn't go astray. Um, it's about, and it's, um, so Orkut is one platform and we're also linking with uh, RED, the research activity identifier. So by project, this time not by person. So what's coming? Uh, for the project is further enhancement. So the UQRDM will be uh, will be used to provision digital research notebooks. So by digital research notebook, we're talking um, electronic lab notebooks. So the, um, the electronic version of the lab lab notebook that goes into the laboratory where uh, researchers put all their notes and sign, etc. So uh, when the researchers create a, a project record on the UQRDM, they will just have to tick a box and a digital research notebook will be made available to them if they choose to. This is about making sure that they keep all version of all documents. So it's particularly uh, important for uh, for compliance issue if, for example, later down the track they want to pattern or they've got very strong uh, requirements in, in terms of keeping all versions of all documents. The other piece that we are working towards is about uh, giving uh, researchers feedback on uh, the use and on uh, a bit more education around the UQRDM. So, for example, uh, raising awareness in terms of uh, how long does that need to be kept for, for example. So, we'd like to feed that back to them. So, having a, 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 an interface where it actually shows, well, your data will be curated for such number of years. It also um, the other piece of information we'd like to feed that back to them is uh, the cost of storage, not that they will have to pay uh, for the storage, but uh, it's about um, making uh, people aware, industry partners, uh, granting bodies, how much UQ is investing in uh, the creation of data and um, raising um, awareness around the income contribution for any kind of project. So it has been an interesting journey. Um, and uh, while the project is still going strong, we know that we've got some uh, challenges ahead of us. So uh, the first one that I will mention is about data management planning. So you, um, Andrew has mentioned that we've got a section on the record uh, that has a series of questions about DMP. We're not quite sure how um, this section will be used. Uh, it's not compulsory, it's, uh, it's totally uh, 
it's totally up to the researchers. So if they want to use it, they can, but will it? So that would be quite an interesting question to revisit later down the track. Um, the other challenges that we've got is around extra sensitive, sensitive data. So uh, we've got a good platform, but when you mention clouds, people can be a little bit concerned, and industry partners in particular. So we have more convincing to do, and uh, making sure that we adapt our system to the more uh, uh, higher requirements, if you'd like. Um, we need to do other st further step towards reproducibility. So uh, there's more education because it's not just about providing storage, it's about educating people what they can put in there, what they should be put putting in there. And also when we get to the archiving, making sure that the package that um, is uh, produced is actually uh, useful for reproducibility. So we've been talking about baggage format, we've been talking to the data crate projects um, to know where we're going. Um, it will also be about keeping the flame alive. So uh, the, the uptake has been swift, as, as I was mentioning, but we very well aware that the system cannot be static. We've got a competitive edge at the moment at UQ because we've got that one view, what single view of research data at UQ, but it's about making sure that the, the system is enhanced to, be, um, to keep on being perceived as uh, one of the, the best platform for UQ researchers. Uh, we've also been talking to uh, scientists who, um, and ma instrument managers that uh, would like uh, the same kind of system but for instruments. So not just about working data but raw data. Uh, it will come in time. We haven't put, uh, we haven't had a single solution at this point in time to offer to them. So it's still in the making. Well, we've got all these challenges. We also know that. Um, the last five months have demonstrated that the platform is successful and have taught us a couple of lessons. So we know that we're on the right track with the engagement process. It's very time consuming, but it's also worthwhile. People are engaging, engaging successfully with the platform. And I don't think it would have been possible if, uh, if we just had released it by an email. It's also uh, making sure we, we, we know that we need to keep on building a unique value proposition. So why is the UQ RDM better than the commercial product at UQ? And keep on message. And um, because of the number of stakeholders, this is quite a challenge as well, making sure that we are, we are saying, we are all saying the same thing. And lastly, uh, we know it's a success because it has, um, involved the input of a lot of people. So it's a mix of people, academics, uh, admin people, library people, uh, recent, PhD recent PhD students, technical staff, and also champions. So researchers have been a big part of it. Um, without their feedback and without their, uh, their engagement with the platform, we, um, I don't think the project would have been that successful. Um, last thing from me um, is about trying to how can I say, uh, building, uh, try to build a, a UQRDM community. So obviously the UQRDM is for UQ researchers, but we have made the code available for evaluation by other universities. So um, I think uh, four within Australia and in New Zealand had access to the code, and it's about sharing the lessons that we, um, we have so far encountered. So that's it um, for the presentation, and we'll be quite happy to answer your questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Sandrine, and thanks, Andrew. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have come through. Um, the first one was a really early one that said, um, what, was the up what is the uptake of EduGain internationally? Mm -hmm. um, do you know? Yeah. <laughs> we, we thought it was very consistent. Turns out, no. Um, it's, it's actually pretty good. I, we don't have hard numbers on our success rate with international partners. I would estimate it to be around about 50-50, if not better. What's interesting is that different countries have made decisions about how they use EduGain. So, for example, the, the Dutch group, uh, Surfnet, I think it's called, they make a decision where if you join a service to EduGain, a university in the Dutch consortium has to ask to have that service included before the Dutch researchers will be able to use it, whereas in every other country, every service is available. Um, in the UK, there's some sensitivities around releasing EPPN, around being um, identifying information, and yet EPPN is a required attribute of the EduGame Federation. 
the approach we've had to take is there's 2,700 plus institutions within EduGain, which means that we have to ask our researchers to try, let us know where it fails. Where it has failed, we've pretty much always succeeded by contacting the technical contact, which is available on the web in the EduGain Federation, contacted them, making the case, this is important to us as UQ. It's important to these group of people within your university. That part is critical. You can't approach the other university and say, you should do this for UQ, they don't care. Please. It's, yeah, please, that, <laughs> even that doesn't work. It's about, here's the identified, if they have prof after their name, it probably works better. <laughs> saying here's four people in your university who want to work with UQ with this system, but we haven't failed once with that approach. Sometimes it takes time, but we haven't failed. Fantastic. That's a, a very good way of going about it for all sorts of systems, not just edu um, game. Okay, the next question we have is, what is UQ planning to do with data after the retention period? Hmm. This is an unsolved question. We don't have any plan for deleting anything. So we're currently in talks with the ITS, um, trying to figure out a solution for data storage, uh, and we're talking long term. Yeah. And there's certainly not a technical problem. There are existing cloud technologies which make it very cheap to store data long term. It's more about the policy around it. So yes, the archiving workflows which are coming allow us to keep data on ice forever at the end of a seven year, five year, whatever project. What's not in place is the university policy around after 25 years, who makes the decision to delete it? That, that's the hard question. It's around what's the process? Do you email the CIs? If they don't respond, what do you do? Do you email the head of school? Who makes the call? And this is we're trying to embed this information when we make the archive to say who has the power to delete this long term, which is why we're taking time to implement the archive. I've just got a question on that one. Do you do you link the data in the archive to um, the DOI on it to see whether it's been used? I mean, I'm sure that that would be part of the decision making process there as well. Absolutely. It's always a hard one there. Okay, another question. Um, I'm interested to know if your code is able to be evaluated by government funded science organisations. Why not? Yeah. Why not? I'd say that would be a email Andrew or Sandrine and ask um, is the answer to your question there. Um, the then, device is around for non-commercial use. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next question is, Andrew mentioned asking what types of data researchers have. Can he please elaborate on what he meant by this? That's very simple. We say, is the data human? Is the data human identified? Do you have data which requires access to HPC. It's really a very small list of questions if you think about it in terms of the business requirements. It typically comes down to things like the Australian Privacy Act, identified human data, has to be within Australia. It's a very small subset. If you'd like details, we're prepared to share, but I've effectively just said the only questions we need to make a decision. Okay. Um I think linked with that might be um, which institutions in Australia are currently accessing the UQRDM code? Uh, I will need to go back to my list. I think we've got University of... No, I don't want to say any, any wrong thing. So <laughs> That's I... right. Later. Email and ask, I think, is the, ask, um, the uh, answer to the question on that one. Um, okay. Uh, I'll just... Uh, uh, let's see. Does the system have any reporting function? In time. So uh, at this point in time, it's an ad hoc reporting to the, the head of units. We uh, tell them how many records they've got in the system, who are the uh, institution that, they are co that the, the researchers are collaborating with. So it's very generic. It's very, uh, it's very uh, not very details because, detailed because the policy in place to share that metadata hasn't been set up yet. So um, we we, cautious, we are cautioned there. Cautious, sorry. And I would say, what is the amount of data in the system? It is immense, um, but it's about keeping researchers trusted. And this is critical. So our project control group is 50% academic represented from every faculty, every level, A, B, C, D, E, across the whole university. The last thing we want to do is say, here's this magical reporting tool. If you use it, the university will know exactly what you're doing. That, that's not <laughs> Can't go bad. Um, 
researchers, I don't know whether it's understandable or not, but they're cautious about being followed minutely. Um, and we have to be very cognizant of that at all points in time. And the feedback we give to them is there is not a policy until there is a policy which everyone will have access to, the, the reporting is minimal right now. It's de-identified. Okay. Um, we just had somebody who's uh, piped up that UOW, I believe, is one of the um, institutions which does have access. Um, Hi, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> um, uh, then someone says, excuse my ignorance, but what is the 25 year period um, retention in relation to? Clinical trials is the typical retention period for is 25 years. For drug development work, for example, it's infinite. Um, it, yeah. So 25 years was really an example for long term. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, the next question is, will the SYNC clients work for other universities and are they open as well? Absolutely. It's based upon the next cloud platform, which is free open source. Um, the, the SYNC client is how the international and national collaborators and industry partners get access to the data if they wish or they use the web front end. Um, yes. Okay. Um, well, the next one is when you say the system code is available for evaluation, is it open source? I think you may have just op uh, answered that question on that one. It's not, it's not a released open source product yet because UQ is keen that they protect their interests in it, which means it will be released under an open source license, but it's going through trademarking of various things now. And the university does not want to release under an open source license until those things are in place. That's understandable. Um, somebody's asking why next cloud and not own cloud? Uh, that was a decision of ITS. There are some technical reasons around it. Um, it's predominantly around the way external storage is mounted into a person's storage. Um, if you're keen on details, contact me out and say why. I understand the community split from own cloud and next cloud, which means we don't maintain compatibility with Arnet Cloud Store. There are a few technical reasons only, it's not philosophical. Okay. Um, and then, do you think there will be one system that will service multiple universities and PFRAs? That would be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> That's your little Santa Claus, is it? <laughs> that, that's certainly a Santa Claus. Um, it's Mars at the moon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's such a complex landscape here, and universities all have different requirements and understandings. I wish the answer was yes. Practically, I think if we could get even one or two universities onto this sort of system and share the technologies, that would be fantastic. Okay. Next question is, is the metadata from the UQ RDM published into RDA and or into your eSpace or other repositories for discovery? So it will be, yes, that's, that will be pushed through eSpace and then after that it's, it's the traditional institutional repository. And yeah. So if the question is around the metadata of the project, mm -hmm. no, that's always private, but the archive, the data sets that come out of that, yes, are pushed into eSpace, which is pushed onto RDA. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a, there were a few discussions around this of should this metadata around all projects in UQ become available after a certain period of time. Numbers were thrown around like seven and ten years. We haven't done it. Is the answer? Okay. Um, that's the last of our long list of questions. So if anybody has a quick question that they want to put in there, just um, put it in there now. Um, I just wanted to ask you about. You said that it was. Um, voluntary to get into it at the moment what has been your uptake and is it a sort of a um, exponential uptake or just a linear little gradual um, no, the, graph is scary. <laughs> the graph <laughs> is scary so it's fairly very swift uh, 22 weeks now since we launched a platform and we've got a thousand records we, wow. we've got thousand three hundred unique users so no it has been very quick it grows on average by about uh, three and a half terabytes a week of storage of data going into the system across the university. It grows by about 50 users a week embryonically without us doing anything and about 10 to 15 projects a week with no effort on our part. Every time we do a rollout, we get a bump of about 30 to 40 
projects in the system. And it really depends upon local policy. Mm -hmm. Some schools, when we say it's not mandatory, it's a school decision in UQ around how they implement some policies. In some schools, they've made it mandatory for all HDR students to have a record on the RDM system by their candidature, which is M1, which is one year into their candidature. But again, a school decision, we don't push it. Okay, somebody says, well done, they're so jealous. <laughs> We, we, the only thing we can do is support them. Um, so we're providing a lot of support in terms of wordings, in terms of, uh, of policies, making sure that it's, you know, for example, in HR uh, induction list or HR um, exit list or this kind of thing. So it's about raising the awareness, but ultimately at this point in time, the schools decide. And our approach has always been, it, there's no point mandating it because if it's not good enough, they're already, researchers are already non-compliant. We're not auditing. We know Dropbox is used. We know other things are used. There's no point mandating a system if you can't meet the demand. And it doesn't work. And it's about it's a slow it's a slow implementation. If we uh, if we decided that we needed to uh, mandate it straight away, perhaps we wouldn't have been capable to have the year take or it would have caused more growing pain and um, break the trust of researchers. Okay. Um, we've got a whole bunch more questions that have come in. So, is, are you advising extra sensitive data users, e.g., health linkage data, clinical trials, etc., to use the system? Yeah, all right. <laughs> There's two parts of the answer to this. One is, okay, I'll answer the technical side. The answer is we built the system to handle it. Um, so, this means for most contracts we see, we can meet the needs of the contract, um, which means we can technically guarantee that the data will only be seen by these four researchers in, in this IP address range and we'll keep every copy of every data and who changed it. Unfortunately, there's also the contractual part of that question, which is Sandra. <laughs> so uh, we take a case-by-case -case approach where we actually ask researchers to check in the contract whether what are the conditions imposed upon them. Uh, for storage for sharing so we cannot say we cannot say cookie cutter approach it's going to be good for everyone go go for it um, we yeah we have to be cautious okay. you all sorts of areas, so that's good um, I think this is a statement here it says the 25 years is a retention period for clinical trials with newborns seven years is standard period for retention with trial data but starts when the youngest trial participant turns 18 so yep. that's for those who are interested okay um, and unfortunately, these things change often. Yeah. So we can't ask at the start, how long do you need to keep it for? Because in five years' time, that information may be out of date. That's true. So, so is that something that going back to people, is that something that you're intending to build into the system then? We've um, thought about feeding it back, but we're also cautious about people gaming the system. Mm. So that means if we give them feedback, if when will they tick the boxes and say, we'll keep this for 25 years? We're not keen on researchers because they're a, a, a wily bunch. They'll figure out which buttons to press to meet their needs, even if they don't understand them. <laughs> well, they are the sort of minds we want in research, aren't they, I think. Um, <laughs> coming here, it says, very interesting talk, thanks. First time I've come across someone who else thinking project-centric, not researcher-centric. So that's a, a very different basis for your system and that possibly will you know, be a very um, big foundation which will make it different from what else is out there. Um, the next question I had was how many person years was it to build the system? Hmm. Uh, development effort or people, all, all the people? It just says to build the system. Oh. Okay, so to build the system development effort, one and a half FTE for two years. Okay. That's the answer. In terms of complete effort, it's probably uh, an average of three and a half FTE mm. for two and a half years total. A lot of in kind, a lot of support, a lot of talking. Mm -hmm. Okay. And sorry, next one. With respect to extra sensitive and keeping access to authorised users only, does your next cloud sync manage sharing data? If it's extra sensitive data, we turn off the synchronization, the share by link functionality within Nextcloud, and this is one of the reasons we chose Nextcloud over Nextcloud. They didn't support the 
time. So it means we can manage how users are allowed to share data within the web interface based upon the type of data on, on a project basis, so for each external share. And yes, we do only allow identified researchers to access the data in a identified human data collection. Okay. Um, now, the next one is, is there a demo or recorded demo to see how a researcher would interact? I presume that means interact with your system. Um, so we've got a user guide that is available to anyone. We've got a couple of videos there that demonstrate the system. So yes, the answer is yes. Yes. Um, and are there checks for file obsolescence? Sorry, are there checks for file obsolescence built into the archival stage? Okay, so <laughs> Andrew's going, yeah, that one. Thought about that one. <laughs> okay. Um, I would like them to be. Um, the answer is, is that I am very keen that the archiving workflows are not just a dump it and put it on ice. Um, there are some existing systems out there, um, probably spearheaded a lot by Pete Sefton in UTS, where there are long-term data archival and curation services that work in the same way as an archivist works in a library. You don't just store something and shove it on the shelf and run away for 25 years. It's about managing that and making sure that documentation and things are up to date. The way we're storing the long-term archives is in Bagot format, possibly data crate. Because it's in a managed format, it means we could run routine checks year on year to make sure file formats are up to date and convert on the fly if possible. It is certainly something we're thinking about. There is no international consensus that I can see on how to do this yet. We will make a decision on that shortly, but we will certainly set it up so that we can. Fantastic. Um, it's just a comment that uh, is with regards to keeping your um, ne next cloud um, sync management and that basically that's super cool um, that you're able to turn off the, the syncing there. So that's the last question that we have. Uh, oh no, another one just snuck in. Can the user guide be made available outside UQ? Sandrine, it seemed to be that it already is. Is that correct? It already is. Yeah. Absolutely. So how would someone find it then? Uh, just contact me. That would be the easiest time I've got. Yeah. Okay. Let's send a group of links. Yeah. If you if you forward things around, we can send a bunch of links to YouTube videos. Sure. If you like send them to me, um, I everybody who's on the webinar will get a uh, an email when the recording is available, and I can put them in that same email if you'd like, and then we can put them at the bottom of the YouTube um, description as well. So that's easy mm -hmm. enough to do. Okay. Oh, goodness me. They keep coming in. <laughs> Who did you get to do the voiceover for the videos? It's very good. Yeah. There you go. That's a comment, <laughs> not, a, not a question. <laughs> I'll pass on to John. Okay, so they've, they've obviously gone out and checked them out already. Um, <laughs> fantastic. So um, I think that's probably time to wrap up now. Thank you so much, Sandrine and Andrew, for your time today. Um, the number of questions coming in has meant that People are really engaged with this topic and really interested in it, and we greatly appreciate your time with that. Um, so thank you, everybody, for coming today, and thank you again for presenting, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, Susanna.